in the sight of our God and Father, knowing, beloved brethren, your election by God. For our gospel did not come to you in word only, but also in power and in the Holy Spirit and in much assurance as you know what kind of men we were among you for, you, for your sake. And you became followers of us and of the Lord, having received the word in much affliction, with joy of the Holy Spirit, so that you became examples to all who believe. For from you the word of the Lord has sounded forth in every place. Your faith toward God has gone out, so that we do not need to say anything. For they themselves declare concerning us what manner of entry we had to you, and how you turned to God from idols to serve the living and true God, and to wait for his Son from heaven, whom he raised from the dead, even Jesus, who delivers us from the wrath to come. Be of good courage, and he shall strengthen your heart, all who hope in the Lord. Amen. Amen. A wonderful job. Thank y'all. Thank you. Children can go to Children's Church. Am I understanding that correctly? Adults can stay for Adult Church. I don't want to see y'all leaving at the back just because they have goldfish crackers and whatever they may offer back there. Maybe if I put some snacks up here, that would help out to get a little bit for our... Our attendance, but we do have the best coffee in town. I know that for a fact because it says it out there on the sign. So if you put it out there, it must be true, correct? You know, we're coming into the season of what's called Advent. And sometimes, you know, a lot of us didn't grow up really knowing much what Advent was. But it's nothing to borrow a line from a friend of mine. It's nothing spooky, kooky, or weird. Advent is simply a term that means the appearing the appearing, it's something that comes upon the earth that's new. We may talk about the advent of electricity or the advent of the combustion engine. Things that were never there that all of a sudden were there. And whenever we begin to move into the advent season, we look at something so much greater. What we're looking at is the appearance of Christ, the first coming, the soon coming, an additional advent. And it's wonderful that it follows immediately after Thanksgiving because in this season of Thanksgiving, I believe that what is to take place in that feeling of thanks, the season of Thanksgiving, is that we are laying up, preparing, if it would, for those times when we need to be reminded, when we need a source of hope, that we can go back into the bucket of our Thanksgiving, the things that we expressed our joy over. You know, if you come to church and you're here, you get to hear us as we give Thanksgiving on the morning, Sunday mornings. And, but then we follow with our prayer request. And we do that just here as a family, not broadcast to the world, because we want to give thanks and praise to honor for the God, things that God has done for us. But then we also want to be able to bring the needs that we need, the, the expressions of those things that we need God to do for us because the following week, the expectation is for you to come back in here and thank God for delivering what you needed from the prior Sunday. That's how thanksgiving and hope evolve. You know, they used to say, I haven't heard in a long time, there used to be expressions that hope springs eternal. You ever heard that? Well, if you've heard it, you're probably over the age of 40 because no one says that anymore. How, you don't hear that hope springs eternal. If you have the misfortune of every now and then watching the news or reading a newspaper, if you even know what that is anymore, you will see that in there is very little hope. There is nothing but negativity. There is nothing that would be able to basically even get you out of bed in the morning. What, what is supposed to stir up within me a desire to be able to do anything if this is what the world has for me? If all I'm going to do is hear stories of killings and the degradation of the, the character of our nation, the fact that people can't even begin to define man, woman, uh, the, the, all the basic definitions are gone. What is our hope for us if we can't even depend on what things mean? 
But the replacement of that, of that fear and that despair and that negativity is found in hope. The first candle of Advent is hope. That's its, what it signifies. Advent, which means, of course, the, the appearing, is a season that we set aside to remember the time leading up to Christ first appearing here on earth. His birth, the nativity. But I believe even more important is to remind us all of the fact that he is coming again. There is to be a second appearing. There is to be a second coming. Whatever term you want to put on it. There is an advent that we should all be hoping for. That we should all be waiting for. That we should all be looking for. When when Jesus first came to earth, he came to earth and we find him there in a stable, in a manger... The absolute lowest point you could have ever put anyone. He came in here so lowly, meek and mild, as the song says. It was, he had no station. He was a man of, uh, of, of no reputation. He came here to represent the lowest possible place you could be found. But yet, at that point where he was... I am amazed at the fact that he was found even then by those who were looking. We've heard the story over the years that the lowest level of society back then would have been the, the shepherds. And when we find the ones who first found Christ, when he first appeared, we have the shepherds there. Why? Why were the shepherds there? Jesus came at night. We know that he was born at night. And who is up and watching and looking at night? Shepherds. Shepherds are always looking for what it is that is going to threaten their flocks. When I'm up and I'm praying at 2 o'clock, 3 o'clock in the morning, 3.30 this morning, and I'm up and I'm praying for this congregation... I am praying because I know that I have a true adversary, a true enemy who says what? That he walks around as it were a roaring lion. He is always seeking to be able to kill, seek, destroy. Those shepherds who lay it awake at night, they lay it awake at night because they knew that there was something out there in the dark circling their flock, threatening them. They didn't know what it was, but they knew that there was something there. I believe, as a shepherd of this flock, that there is something circling this congregation. I don't know exactly what it is. I think it takes many names. Some people may say, oh, well, the past few years, what has been circling this congregation? What has been picking us off by ones and twos was COVID. They'll tell us that's what it was. You do realize that when the shepherds woke up in the morning, the first thing that they would do is they would begin to count. We count here every Sunday. Brother Michael counts and we keep a record. Every morning when the sun came up, a good shepherd would take and they would count. We know that's what a good shepherd does because we're told what? If he wakes up and he had 100 when he, or he gets up and he had 100 when the sun went down and the sun comes up, he's got 99. He's going to spend the rest of his time doing what? Looking for the one lost sheep. So we count and we look. And then we try and find out what it is that picked off these lambs, picked off these sheep. And I've got to tell you, it was not COVID. COVID, that's not what it was. I think what picked off and pulled people out of this congregation possibly could have been fear. Some that left out of fear. Fear of what? I don't know. But that's when my prayer over this congregation, I see that fear began to pull some people out. I began to see that I think idle gossip began to circle. You do realize that gossip has more teeth than any wolf you'll ever come across. I believe that it began to circle and circle and circle. And what it does is it instills fear. What it does is it puts fear in and fear comes in in the place of what? Hope. Somehow, when the sun came up, hope was gone for most of this church and most of the people in this church. The wolf came in and took away hope. 
It took away vision. It took away promise. It came and took away everything that the flock had been established for. I'm not faulting the shepherd. I'm just saying that we have now got to the point where we need to identify and name our enemies. We have got to be able to do that because that is how we have hope. I have hope that God will deliver this congregation. I have hope that God will put within us the desire once again to be a family. I have got to make sure that at some point in time that when I'm worried that the wolves came and took my sheep, I got to make sure that I didn't have sheep pushing sheep out. You know that'll happen? What if my fear is the fact that a not good shepherd came in and pulled off some of my sheep? Is that possible? Can it be that they were led astray? That the sheep decided on their own to walk off to what they thought was a greener pasture? You do realize God set us up and said that we are sheep and he is the good shepherd and we used to raise sheep and I've got to tell you they are absolutely not the smartest member of the barnyard. It's just a fact. But you know what? When the sun goes down, we open up the gate and we bring them all back in and we watch over them we pray for them. We love them, no matter where they've been or why they left. We instill into them that this is a place of hope. Hope, hope, hope. Where has hope gone? Not only were the shepherds awake looking to see what was happening and taking a current account of the situation you also had the magi the 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 song i tell you it was three wise men right what were they doing they were looking what were they looking for i don't think they really knew exactly what they were looking for but they were looking for something and they begin to look in two places we know the part where they looked and they saw what a star But if you follow the story, they begin to tell you, hey, we have read in your text to where we know where he'll be born, right? Says he's going to be born there. Oh, you lowly Bethlehem. We know where he's going to be born. We know that there is a king coming. So they saw a sign in the heavens and they found where? In the word of God, the truth. We as a people, if we are to be filled with a hope to come, have to be looking for Christ and his second returning. We look for him where? We look for him in his word and we look for him in the heavens. We look for him in his deeds. We look for him in the things that he is doing to those people around us. You realize that as at one point in time, God halted and moved all of heaven to do something so specific that those who were looking for it saw it. God is doing that today. Are you looking for it? When you begin to see all these things, these signs, these things happening in the world, in the newspaper, on the news, you begin to look for them. I don't, I don't understand them. Where do you go to look for the answers? Here, the Word of God. The church universal has left the Word of God. There's no way to get back around that. Once you leave from it, that, that's it. They just, they begin to leave that. You know, there were two other people that were looking for Christ in his return. There were Anna and Simeon. Anna and Simeon, two old people that had spent all their time in the temple doing what? Praying. I want you to notice two things about Anna and and Simeon. What were they doing? Praying. And don't miss this last part. Where were they? In the temple. I'm not pointing that out to all of you who are here in the temple, here in the congregation, here in the assembly. I'm pointing out to those of you who are not here. Anna and Simeon, when they saw Christ, when they saw the incarnation of the Word of God, they were able to see him because they were there where he was when he was there. 
There are times when God will literally stir the pool, if you will, when the Spirit of God comes in. Many of you have been here in this church when the Spirit of God has come and the Spirit of God has moved, and you were able to experience it. Why? Because you were here. You may say, oh, I never see God move over there. Where were you? You weren't even here. How could you not see it? They were in the temple and they were doing what? They were praying. They were praying for years for his appearance. How many of you have something you prayed for for years? How many of you have a family member you prayed for for years? You know what I need you to do now? I need you to pray for this church, for this congregation. It may be years. I don't know. My God tells me that him a thousand years is as a day. But I know, we need, I know when we need to start it, we need to start it now. Then, like now, Jesus is found for those who seek him. Yesterday, a dear old friend of mine saw Jesus. I think she had been looking for him. I can't look over there because I, I can't get through this message if I keep looking at that empty pew over there. But instead, I stand here rejoicing because yesterday she experienced the second coming of Jesus Christ in her life. She experienced him at the first coming when she accepted him as her Savior, and she experienced him yesterday in his second coming when she was there with her Savior with his arms wrapped around her. When everything that she had ever believed and stood upon was brought together in the arms of Christ. And I believe that she was found looking. Family told me when I went by there yesterday afternoon that they knew a few things that had kind of happened. The door was locked. She always locked the door at night. But she'd always unlock the door when she began to get going during the day. But on the table was her Bible, laid open. Beside the Bible was a half-eaten honey bun. And they found her in a prayer position on the side of the bed. It sounds to me as if she was ready to take a trip. And the whole time over there, knowing what I was going to meet, a family in need, I could depend on 2 Corinthians 5, 8. It says, yes. We are of good courage. And we would rather be away from the body and at home with the Lord. We are in good courage. You know what good courage is? Good courage is the opposite of bad fear. Good courage is simply hope. We are of hope. For we would rather be away from this body and to be present with the Lord. They say it was so fast, so sudden, it just no wasn't expected. When I was writing this message before I knew that she had passed, something kept going over and over in my head. It said, if you are young, today is the day to accept Christ Jesus. And if you are old, today is the day to accept Christ Jesus. Whether you're 25, 75, or 105, today is the day to accept Christ Jesus. She did not wake up yesterday morning, open her Bible and open her honey bun, thinking that in just a few minutes she would see her Savior. But she did. How many have began their day, poured their coffee, and immediately been in the presence of eternity, but not the eternity that they were expecting? Today is the day. Miss Flora is not there, but she is with her heavenly Father. She left this temporary dwelling. She left her house, her body. Instead, found a forever home, rejoined with Mr. Buster, the man who loved God, a man who I was blessed to be able to serve with here as a deacon, and a man that I have no doubt was waiting for her there with her Lord and Savior yesterday. She saw Jesus yesterday because she had been looking and because she was prepared She was not like the foolish virgins that we read about. That when Christ comes, we're not prepared. She was prepared. She was ready. I think that she was like John the Baptist. John chapter 1 verse 23. John the Baptist replied in the words of Isaiah the prophet. He said, what I am the voice of one calling in the wilderness. Make straight the way for the Lord. 
Miss Flora was forever telling her kids and her grandkids, look, y'all need Jesus, and then you need to go to church. You know that one doesn't have to precede the other. You need Jesus, and you need to go to church. She stood on that promise, stood on that promise, stood on that promise, and she stood in that back foyer back there with me, crying and crying tears of joy as she began to see her grandson up here worshiping and praising God. She saw that because she was looking for that. She was praying for that. She was expecting that. I can tell you this, that the rest of her family is going to hear the opportunity this week from someone. They'll have the opportunity to be with her only if they accept Jesus Christ as their Savior. That is the only way to be able to honor her in her memory. All of us here who miss her and want to see her again, there's only one way to see her again. To hold to that blessed hope. She knew where she was with Christ. She knew where she was in her life, but she was not satisfied unless she knew that she could be there with her kids and with her grandkids. She knew the only way to be reunited with those loved ones that had died before was in that blessed hope. The blessed hope. We talk about the blessed hope as Christians. We do know what the blessed hope is. The blessed hope is that we will one day be with Christ Jesus. That we will be reunited with those who died in Christ Jesus. That is the blessed hope. When we remember today is Advent hope, that is the hope that we're talking about. Last week when we stood around this tables full of food and we gave thanks and we praised God and we thank God for this and for that, think for our health, we think about all of these things, we were just beginning to accumulate and accumulate so much that we can draw from when we need hope. Anyone in here ever get to a point where you just face despair and you just, for, for, for the briefest of moments, hope is gone? Am I the only one? Because you know what comes with that? Life, life does that to you. There are days that life will hit you hard. But you know what? I can pull into that bucket where I thank God for the fact that he gave me salvation. I can pull in that bucket of thanks where I thank God that he gave me health. I can thank God where he healed me in the past and say, you know what? My God who's done it before can do it again. That's what hope is. That's what hope is. We know that he's going to do it again. When my Jesus came the first time, he came as an answer to prayer for a people diligently seeking him, diligently praying for his return. Why were they so desperate for his return? They were ruled by government that wasn't their government. They were being told things by preachers, teachers, that went opposed to the word of God. They were living in a world that was corrupt, a world focused with nothing but the sins of the flesh. And they were praying and they were praying and they were praying and to them the prayer was answered and Christ came. 2,000 years later, how are we any different than where they were? And I think the difference is that there are so many of us today who are not praying what we're told to pray, which is, even so, come quickly, Lord Jesus. There is not one thing on this earth that's going to keep me from heaven. There's not one thing on this earth that would tell me to be able to delay. The only reason I read of a delay in Christ's return is because of his mercy and his grace extended to those who have not yet accepted Christ. So you know what? If I'm praying, come quickly, Lord Jesus, I better be working as hard as I can to make sure that when he comes quickly, we all go with him. Whoever's on your pew, make sure they're going with you. Whoever sat around that table with you at Thanksgiving as y'all split a turkey in half, you better make sure they come in with you. Have you done all that you can do? Have you prayed? Have you seeked? And then have you shared? Have you shared with them what God has done for you? I think on the day that Jesus came, we had shepherds in the field. We had magi looking in the stars. When Jesus comes back, 
He's going to find people that are doing this. They're going to be walking. They're going to be walking. It says in Scripture in the days of Noah, people were doing what? Eating, drinking, giving in marriage, taking in marriage. They were doing everything on their daily life, right? When Christ comes back, he's going to find every one of us, everyone in this world, they're going to be walking. And there's only two choices. They're going to either be walking toward heaven or they're going to be walking toward hell. And when Christ comes back, he's either going to speed up their trip and bring them into heaven or he's going to let them pass right along the way that they have chose through that wide gate. My God sends no one to hell. My God allows those who have made the choice to go, to go the way they've, they've chosen. Walk ye the way in which you have chosen. But you know what? The whole time they're walking the wrong way, I better be right there in their ear telling them, I love you, and I love you enough that I'm going to tell you that you're on the wrong path. I'm not going to go up to them and say, I love you, I love you, I love you. I realize you're walking this way, and I support you in this life choice that you have made. I support you that you've chosen this, which is outside of the Word of God. I love you. I love you. God loves you. You've got freedom to be able to do what you want. You've got freedom to do what you want. And I watch as they just fall off the cliff. That's not love. If you have someone in your family who is purposely denying the things of God, the things of Christ, they may be wrapping it up into their own, God forbid, their own religion or spirituality, whatever they want to call it, and it does not align with the Word of God. It is of the hell, and they are heading straight to hell. That's it. I I wish I could give it another way. I wish I could whitewash it, paint it up. I just can't. That's the way that it is. You're either walking toward heaven or you're walking toward hell. Which path are you on? You. You out there in TV land, or what do you want to call it? Where, what path are you on? You are on a path. Don't ever get think that you're not. You are on a path. And let me tell you this, Christians. The way you are leading your life is influencing someone in their choices of which path they take. You, by the way you lead your life, are either leading people to the cross or away from the cross. What you do, what you say, how you act, are you bringing people to Christ or away from Christ? Only two choices. There is no lukewarm. There is no sitting the fence. There is no gray. There is black and there is white. It either is God or it is not God. Period. And that part in the middle there, that's the wolf that's picking people off in the church. We can't have that. We can't say, well, that's sin, but that's not. Well, you know what? It's sin, but it's a little sin. We begin to grade sin. We begin to do it. No, 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 no. It either is of God or is not of God, period. It's time to draw that line. So I ask you the question, what path you're on? Now I'm going to ask one that hurts. What path are your children on? What path are your grandchildren on? Everyone chooses their own path. Yes, they do, but I'm going to be right there doing everything I can to get them on the right path. I'm going to ask this. Have you clearly laid out a map for them on how to reach the right path? How to reach Christ? Oh, I don't know what to get my kids for Christmas. I know what to get them. Give them a true map of salvation that has your name on it. I don't want to go buy a book that tells me how to get somewhere. I want to find somebody that's been there. You tell me. You tell your grandkids why you accepted Christ. You tell your kids why you came to the point where you are. You share your testimony. They don't care to hear from me. There's a thousand fat white men waving a Bible they can find right now on YouTube. They don't want to hear from them. My job, my purpose is to tell you all in here the Word of God and then for you to go out and share the Word of God with the people I don't know, the people that don't trust me. There's a rule that I do everything in the life, everything I do as far as business that I go into, stocks, I buy anything. It's a test of three. Do I know them, do I like them, and do I trust them? Your family members that are about to split hell wide open, they don't know me, they don't like me, they don't trust me. 
They know you, they like you, they trust you. What are you showing them? What are you giving them? Isaiah 30, 21 tells us exactly what this means. It says, your own ears will hear him. Right behind you, a voice will say, this is the way you should go, whether to the right or to the left. In this is is the the scripture. This is the word of God. Your own ears will hear him. Right behind you, a, a voice will say, this is the way you should go. This is the way that you should go. Yes, I believe you can hear the audible word of God. Yes, I believe that God can speak from his spirit to your spirit. Yes, I believe God can speak to you as you read his word. Yes, I believe God can speak to you through someone else. But we have to be listening. But when I read this, I got something else. It got to me. It said, your own ears will hear him. And it says, right behind you, a voice will say. It doesn't say his voice. How many of you have a pastor, a mother, a father, someone you looked up to that preached the word of God? And whenever you know you're about to do something that ain't right, you're going to hear in their voice that which is not of sin. The faith is what? Sin. That which is not of faith is what? Sin. You're going to hear in their voice that the things in this world are temporary. Is it the word of God? Yes, it is. But it's in a voice that you know, you love, and you trust. Let your children, your grandchildren, your friends, let them hear the word of God in your voice. I can't do that. Have you given your friends and family the opportunity to hear God's word in your voice? That voice that they trust? You do realize there are many, many, many voices in this world. There is so much noise in this world. We used to talk about the channel. The TV had, what, 130 channels and nothing on. Now, there's over a billion YouTube videos right now. There's Reels, there's Facebook. God forbid there's TikTok. Something that will suck you in and suck you in and suck you in. And it's an algorithm. It knows what you like. It'll show you a quick 30-second video and right immediately starts another 30-second video. And it knows what you like. It knows what you like. And just begins to fill you with so much garbage. It's literally what I call an assault on the ears and an assault on the eyes. How do we get rid of all that? It's by listening for the one true voice that we will be found in the temple praying like Anna and Simeon. That we will be found like the Magi, reading the word of God, looking for signs in the heaven. That we will be, I pray you are all like the shepherds, looking out for all of those around you. Sounding an alarm when something is wrong. Going out and looking for those who are lost. That's what we're here to do. Let us be the voice of God. Let us be the voice of reason to someone. That word's gone. Reason? There's no such word anymore. Scripture tells us what? Come let us reason together. There's no more of that. They're they're black. They're black on an issue. White on an issue. They're, They're up. They're down. They're left. They're right. Come let us reason together. Let's see what it lines up with the word of God. We should all be found working for and speaking truth to those in need. Miss Flora was found reading the word of God laid out on the table. She was found in a position of prayer. But in the middle is that odd little thing. What was in the middle? A half-eaten honey bun. And that brought me to Matthew chapter 4, verse 4. It says, man shall not live on bread alone, but on every word that comes from the mouth of God. Whatever was laid out before her, there was something so much better. 
something so much better. What was laid before her was a life eternal with Christ. I push the word of God because I can't find anything else to depend on. Anything else that calms my spirit. Anything else that gives me hope other than the Christ I see in the word of God. The incarnate Christ. We receive that word, the life, that eternal life, by reading and by hearing his word, by conversing with God in prayer. It has to be real to us. It has to be communication. That is how we prepare for a second coming. If you are not reading your Bible, if you are not praying to God, if you are not looking out for those around you, you will not be prepared for a second coming. And remember what I told you, Miss Flora got her second coming yesterday. Christ may come and split the skies. You may meet him in the middle of the air. You may leave this world in a rapture. You may leave this world at the true second coming when the whole world is wiped away. But one way or another, everyone's going to have a second coming and an opportunity to meet Christ. Are you ready? Are you ready? Do you have that hope? Hope isn't just a candle. Hope is something that lives within inside of us. Have you made sure that others you know possess that hope? Is today your day? Miss Flora, when she sat down, she didn't know it was her day. But it was her day. Is today your day? Are you ready? She was ready for her trip. Are you ready? Is today the day? Matthew 24, 36 tells me this, but about that day or that hour, no one knows Not even the angels in heaven nor the Son, but only the Father. No man knows the day, no man knows the hour. The important thing is that you know Christ. Do you know Christ? Are you ready? Are you ready? Your friends, your family, are they ready? As I saw the grief expressed yesterday and the grief in the week to come, I gotta turn this off. 